My name is John McKinney. I'm a professor with the Global Health Institute School of Life Sciences at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, that's EPFL, in Lausanne. Today I'm going to talk to you about a once and future plague, tuberculosis, a disease that has been with humanity for about as long as humanity has existed, but as you'll see, continues to be one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality even today. So I'd like to begin by reminding you of how human uh, history in recent years has differed from human history at any time in the past. That's shown here where I have graphed the total, uh, total global human population versus calendar year going back to about 10,000 BC at about the time that agriculture was invented and humanity began to congregate in cities. As you can see, for most of human history and prehistory, there was little change in the global human population. That started to change quite dramatically a few hundred years ago in which uh, the human population started to undergo rapid growth, which continues to this day. So as you can see, there's rapid exponential growth right up to the present time. So that is quite unprecedented in human history. Even more strikingly, in the last 200 years or so, the rate of urbanization of humanity has outpaced even this incredible rate of population growth. So looking back about 200 years ago to the year 1800, less than half of the human population lived in cities. Now, more than half of humanity is congregated in cities. Why do these factors matter, population growth and urbanization? Well, from a pathogen's point of view, our bodies are merely substrate for them. So having a lot of substrate congregated together in a small space to maximize transition, uh, transmission potential is optimal, obviously. So in a sense, things have never been so good as they are today for pathogens that infect human beings. Now, pathogens have learned how to exploit many different routes of entry into our bodies. Some pathogens, the malaria parasite being a notable example, have learned how to exploit insect vectors to become directly injected into the bloodstream of their bodies, a kind of optimal route of entry, if you like. Others enter the bloodstream through scratches, abrasions, and so on. But the fact is that most pathogens, including most bacterial pathogens, enter through mucosal surfaces, including the respiratory tract, the digestive tract, and the urogenitor. Uh, urogenital tract. These pathogens are, have learned to exploit the food that we eat, the water that we drink, and so on, as their means of getting from one host to the next. Uh, the tubercle bacillus that causes tuberculosis is a notable example of a pathogen that has learned how to be transmitted through the air that we breathe. So you, I'm sure all remember when you were a kid, your mom used to tell you to cover your mouth when you coughed or sneezed. As usual, mom was right. The reason that she told you to cover your mouth or your, your nose when you sneeze is because when you cough or sneeze, you produce huge numbers of airborne particles like this. And if this individual who's coughing had tuberculosis, many of these airborne particles would contain viable tubercle bacilli transiting from this individual to the next host. Now, when these bacteria are respired into the airways, most of these bacteria will impinge on the upper airways where they will become trapped in the mucus lining the airways that is secreted by these goblet cells, the bare patches here. Those trapped bacteria will then be swept up and out by the mucociliary uh, ciliary elevator, uh, the ciliary action of these uh, ciliated epithelial cells, where they will uh, end up in the mouth and then be swallowed and destroyed in the stomach. So in fact, in order to initiate infection, the tubercle bacillus has to penetrate all the way down into the terminal ramifications of the respiratory tree, all the way down into the lung alveoli, where they can implant be phagocytosed by resident alveolar macrophages, the cell type that they parasitize within the lung and initiate replication. So that's the sequence of events that leads to just about every new case of tuberculosis infection. What happens following these initial events, though, is enormously variable from individual to individual, which to my mind is one of the chief mysteries and uh, challenges of tuberculosis and is beautifully encapsulated, I think, in this quote from a classic paper by the epidemiologist George Comstock at Johns Hopkins in which he stated that following infection, the incubation period of TB, that is the interval between exposure to the pathogen and the development of overt signs and symptoms of disease, can range from a few weeks to a lifetime. In other words, TB is a classic example of a persistent, even a lifelong infection, in which disease may not develop for months, years, or even decades after initial exposure. It's very common in endemic countries for individuals to be infected in childhood and not to develop disease until immunity aid uh, wanes with old age. 